Thank you very much. Thank you all. Hi, good morning, everyone. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I have a few German words that I'm picking up. Brauerst. Schnitzel. <laughs> Everyone's got a favorite. I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey today. I want to pepper in some of my execution experience, my wisdom. I want to talk about business a little bit. Much of it is, much of it is about the creativity of forward-thinking thought. And I hope at the end of it, I can leave a little bit of inspiration about how everyone can participate. And I begin every conversation with a quick question. Who in the room thinks that someone should do something about what's occurring in the ocean? Is there anyone in the room that doesn't think that something has to be done? Then we would all easily, easily step forward and say, someone has to do something about this. We would all be very, very emphatic about it. Easily step forward and say, something must occur. And I would argue that it is actually the second thought that you have. The first thought that you had was that you want to do something about it and you don't know how. We all want to do something about it, we're all moved to action. But doesn't it seem overwhelming? Doesn't it seem daunting? So how do I start? So I put out the hope. I hope someone does. And today is going to be about how we all get to participate. As a prelude as well, I want to communicate in this great group of creative minds. Those are minds that I'm always looking for to join our great organization. There's always space for great people to do great things. And when we bring creativity, it becomes exponential for us. So see yourself in this conversation to see if you can fit with us as well. This is going to be my very, very first telepathic uh, presentation. <laughs> <laughs> we, all, we all know Greta today. We all know Greta. That's the first business conversation I'm going to have with you today. You know, I saw a conversation with Mark Zuckerberg. We all know Mark, the CEO of, and founder of Facebook. And the journalist in the audience asked, said, Mark, how do I create a community? And they just simply said, you can't. You cannot create a community. You can simply reveal a community. And that is what Brenna has done. She's revealed a generation, the Generation Z is followed by the millennial, who is absolutely passionate about what is occurring. I had a recent experience with someone who was speaking about this generation. And I think that what was most powerful for me in this generation was that this 16-year-old, 17-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 14-year-olds, 18 year olds, all also survived through one of the greatest recessionary periods in history. So many of that generation went through a time where they felt or thought that their family may lose their home, they may become destitute, financial systems were collapsing globally. A great fear, and on the outside of that, they're faced with ocean acidification global warming, marine debris. So it's no wonder that that entire generation is moved to the action. And we need to know in business that if you're going to invest, over-investing in what is, as opposed to investing in what will be, is a part of what will put you out of business. Remember, you need to invest in what will be, and what will be is not sustainability. Sustainability is passé. Passé, inauthentic, to stand forward and say, this year we'll do less damage than we did last year. This year we'll degrade less. Congratulations. 
We're entering the regeneration economy. And those companies will stand forward to repair the damage that's been done will be the ones that win. It's a little bit about what we do. Investing in what will be and in the ambition of repair. Authentically standing forward to not just repair the damage you've done, but the damage that others have done as well. See, completely telepathic. <laughs> so much fun. <laughs> And there is a mass extinction occurring. As recently in Biome 2, a United Nations report that expresses that almost 200 species are on the verge of or go extinct every day. Birds, plants, and animals. 200 species a day, it's phenomenal. Greatest rate of mass extinction ever next to the extinction of the dinosaurs. I struck with the knowing that out of the 10 billion species that have been on the Earth, Somewhere around 10 billion species have existed since the creation of life on the planet. Out of all of the 10 billion species, humans have been the only species capable of stewarding and caring for all others. And yet we do. The only species we can say that our evolution in fact maybe came as a hope that that is what we would do. Perhaps it's the lands. Let's have hope. There's a mass extinction occurring as we communicated. There's millions of animals dying from encountering plastic. There's more than a garbage truck of plastic entering the ocean every minute of every day. At every minute of every hour of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year. It's going to occur this year. More debris will occur, enter the ocean next year, the year after that. Marine debris has been entering the ecosystem years previous and it's been occurring for decades. Seems catastrophic. Kind of and I believe that it is no different, and the solution lies in real simplicity. And if you were to walk into your kitchen, and your sink is overflowing, the water's spilling all over the floor. You've been away, let's say, you're in Spain for a few weeks, and you came home and you discovered water seeping into the foundation of your home. And in that moment, as you enter, you would pet it. Water spilling, and you have to reach for a bucket, a mop, or a plunger. What would you do first? What would you do first? You turn off the tap. <clears throat> and why aren't we doing the same thing for the ocean? Like, even, even if the beach cleanups were 100% effective, even if, you know, Boyne Slot, Bless Boyne Slot is trying to create an ocean cleanup project, even if that was 100% effective, even if people were trying to sell bracelets or extracting a pound at a time were 100% effective, too little, too late. There's going to be somewhere around 10 billion kilo entering the ocean this year, racing to meet the other 150 billion kilo already there. There's around 9 trillion kilograms of plastic already on the planet. 9 trillion kilo, almost all the plastic we've ever produced is still here. A very small amount has been used for energy, tiny amount has been recycled. But almost all the plastic we've ever created is still here. Like, do you remember being a child and having a plastic toy? Do you remember having like a plastic phone or something like that when you were a baby? It's still here, somewhere. Crazy. The coffee cup lid you took 10 years ago is still here. And we keep making more. This year, humanity is going to produce somewhere around 350 billion kilo. It's worth roughly a dollar a kilo, more actually. This year, the world is going to produce $350 billion worth of plastic, use it for less than about a minute, and discard it in the environment. It's crazy. And it's an amazing business opportunity. And that's what the conversation is going to be about today. About seeing value where no one saw it before. Flow. The 
this place of being, this place of being and purpose. Time flies by. It's true. It feels like it feels like a year is a day. It's so beautiful. And so now I'm going to take you on the journey and have to do telepathically. I'll change the slide and I'll communicate uh, almost all the plastic that is entering the ocean is coming from areas of poverty. It's not whether you decline any straw and do some work that will make a difference, although it does make a difference because it creates a space for other people to say no to. But 80% of it or more is coming from areas like this. This is in Haiti, this is in Port au Prince, an area that we work in. And think of the condition. Think if you live under a dollar a day, a dollar fifty a day. Let's say you've got two dollars, and you have children at home, and you probably don't have an actual floor. You live on top of dirt. You may have a sheet or a piece of plastic as a door. You most probably don't have power. You absolutely will not have. An indoor toilet, you might have a bucket. You probably will lose a child from simple things like fever. So treatable, give them an acetaminophen here and you save your child's life. You might not be aware of that, but countless children die just from fever. You really don't have an idea of what tomorrow will hold. You fight daily for your existence and the existence of your family. You may have some small animals. Could you imagine all of that? I mean, they're very happy people. Don't confuse a lack of material wealth with poverty. Two totally different things. But imagine living in that condition. Do you really care about recycling? No. You don't even know about recycling. You don't even know what plastic is. You probably never left your village. You have a very, very basic elementary school education. Maybe, if you were lucky. See, people ask me all the time, they say, David, why don't you just tell the poor to recycle? Don't they know they should be recycling? No, they don't know. They have no idea about recycling. I have another conversation that says, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Have you ever won a political argument on Facebook? No. <laughs> so I can't convince people to do anything. Not possible. Especially people who are living in a condition like that. <laughs> I'm going to show you this little quick video so you get a greater sense of the enormity of it. See, it's, a, it's just a big setup. I'm setting up the whole thing. And uh, this, is, this is from the streets of Haiti, taken by one of my staff for the orientation. Let's play so you all have an idea of what the world is like. Garbage away. 
Now it's not for burn it. And if you burn it, you're gonna suffer too. Right? <laughs> and it's those conditions that, that led us to create the plastic bank. We're a beautiful ecosystem that reveals value in what was waste. I'm gonna take you through all of the different components of it, but we've really grown to be the world's largest chain of stores for the ultra, ultra poor. Where everything in the store can be purchased using plastic garbage, like school tuition, medical insurance, pharmaceuticals, Wi-Fi, cooking fuel, high efficiency stoves, everything the poor need and can't afford using plastic garbage as payment. See, I can't convince anyone against their will. See, what we've done, I'm going to show you, there's a whole, diff whole bunch of different ways that we actually do work it. And we talked about this center because it's really important for me, and it's really how I got here. And I don't know what kind of knowledge I have. I'm going to show you one more thing. If you were to walk over a field, let's say you were walking from the parking lot here, and all you saw were diamonds on the floor and bars of gold and rubies. You go, oh my gosh, diamonds. Amazing. Oh. And you want to think of diamonds like, oh, diamonds. Well, hold on a second. Where would I spend the diamonds? There's no one that I could actually spend the diamonds or gold with. There's no one that actually can barter the diamonds or gold with me. And, and there's no bank that I could deposit the value of the diamonds into. Would you still pick them up? Probably not. They stay on the ground worthless like rocks. And that's the plastic bank. It's a location-based ecosystem that inherently reveals the value in a petroleum product that is sitting on the ground. So that everyone can look and go, wow, I'm walking over fields of diamonds. But now there's something that I can do with them. I can actually take it and I can buy pharmaceuticals. I can buy life-saving pharmaceuticals for my children. I can put my children in school. I have the opportunity to end my poverty because I have an opportunity to use those to pay for the things that I need the most. That's the plastic. And this center built in Port of Prince with the beautiful support of Henkel. The beautiful, loving, great company whose values are sustainability and family. This center was built in an area of people with special needs. Now, it turns out that there are different levels of poverty. And again, don't confuse a lack of material wealth and poverty. They're two totally distinct and different things. The happiest people don't have to have stuff. I would argue that the less stuff you have, the happier you are. That's for sure. And these people are happy as well. But there's a level of poverty. So if you had a child that was born with special needs, it turns out that in much of the world, they think that your family did something evil in a previous life. Crazy. So if you had a child that had Down syndrome, or was autistic, or was blind, or was... You're ostracized. You're removed from the community. This is a community, almost like a leper colony, but a community of people with special needs. And you can see this, you can see how, how, I mean, we built it on purpose this way. It is the most beautiful building in the community. It's on a concrete pad, which nobody has. You can see the lamp standard behind it. It's got a solar panel on top of it. It's got an industrial light on it. We have countless pictures of children studying and reading below it. Countless pictures of children playing at night with it. It becomes a community center where everybody is identified, recognized. And it's a community hub. Where all of a sudden, all the plastic in your family has, or in the streets around you, becomes money. All of a sudden, you have a paradigm shift. And you see life differently. Fun. This is Lise. She's one of our um, favorite collectors. I've been talking about her for years now, and for good reason, and her life just continues to blossom. She survived the 2010 Haitian earthquake. She was left as a widow. At the time she had two children, now she has seven. She's one of our super collectors. She's been through all the training, all the support. 
and she earns a regular income. She drops her kids off at school, she goes out with friends typically, it's a very social activity. And they go out and they collect together. So she collects material during the day, and she returns it back to the center, where all the material is weighed and checked for quality, and then we add more value by taking off the label and the rings and all those things. We can make sure that everything is, is great. And we transfer value into an online bank account for her. Now, it certainly could be immediately transferable into cash. But what we do is we give her a sense of savings. It's a IBM architected and engineered blockchain based banking application for the world. Because now there's a bank anywhere and you're holding it. And she earns her living by going either door to door, creating a route. Very entrepreneurial. We help her learn how to handle the material, material types, all those things. How to ultimately be very effective and build her volume. It's an unlimited entrepreneurial experience. The harder she wants to work, the more she can make. There's no limit on who she can be in her life. We remove all boundaries from normal daily existence. We set her free. And thousands of others. And we figured we had to really be truly exponentially scalable. We had, to, we had to create something powerful for the world because we needed to act fast because the ocean cannot wait. And so how do we do that in the end? How do we truly bring scale to the world when we don't through education? Which is why we have chains and chains and we're gonna, we'll, end, we'll end next year at maybe 3,000 schools as collection locations for the world. And we go in, we educate the children, we spend time to have them learn about recycling, about the stewardship of the material, the ecosystem, the environment, we train the teachers to train children. And every school becomes a collection location. So the children can take their household material instead of mom burning it or throwing it in the canal and segregate it at home and it's brought to the school as a collection location. We then connect the collection location with the recycling. Countless children that receive scholarship to go to school because they've been returning plastic to pay for the education. So the plastic now isn't just plastic, it's not just recycling, it truly is the end of poverty. You don't look at the bottle as a bottle. If you can't send your children to school, you will never end the poverty in that family. So now they can look at it and go, oh, diamonds and gold. Powerful. And it's just so fun with the children. And they learn, they absorb, and they take the message home. And then, of course, they've got their family. And the family learns how to more powerfully steward, how remarkable. So much fun. <laughs> yeah, and they're also beautiful. So that was, those were two models, location-based stores, community centers, community hubs. Outside of that as well, we've also created a way through a simple scale and a smartphone. Anyone in the world can accept social plastic, which is the material we collect. We'll talk about that. Social plastic by weight as a form of payment. So if you're a little grocery store in the Philippines and you identify yourself in the application, people can take their plastic to pay for cell phone minutes there. Or they can buy a brick to build their house using plastic garbage as payment. So anyone in the world with a simple scale of a smartphone. Schools, so powerful. This will really be the model for the world. This is, this is a cooperative. Mm -hmm. This is a group, there's 176 individual people in, in the Philippines who are all individual collectors. And they're out collecting material and selling it to middlemen, and the middlemen would then sell it to a middleman, and the middlemen would sell it to a middleman, and the middleman always make the least. And so what we did is we brought them together under a set of bylaws. And we appointed a president and a council and all those things, and we ultimately doubled everyone's income overnight. We removed all the layers of middlemen to make sure that the collector made the most amount of money, the volume doubled. After the first month, because we were really never to be a candy crusher recycling, how do we gamify what we do? After the first month, 30 of the women received smartphones. They never had a phone before, they went to a smartphone, we went back the next day, they were taking pictures of me for their Facebook account. For that shirt, they never got it. But how beautiful, we, went, we took people who, were, who never had a phone before, never felt included before,
for, and we brought them to the society. And the story that resonated with me the most was that, see, almost all of our management are, are women. So, so important is women think win-win. Men think win. Women think win-win. So all country management, certainly women, and, 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 and uh, Diane, who was our country manager at the time, told me that the women were coming to her because they wanted to dye their hair, because they were going to have a picture on Facebook. Remarkable. And so we get to witness the end of poverty. You actually get to see it leave.
and woven by the impoverished Catholics of the world. That was really captivating for the Pope. Really powerful. Something that truly ties the spirit in the service of love and stewardship of the earth. Super cool. All of that material we're collecting, we add value to like Lisa, which she brings it back to the center, we take off labels and caps and all those things. And we add value to it, and we find a recycler on the ground. We don't want to build anything, we want to be exponential. We only work with entrepreneurs who are already there. And we take all the material we collect from each of the centers, we take it back to the recycler, or more value is added. It's, it gets ready for export as a raw material if we can't manufacture it in country. It's either shredded, or what's called flaking, and then more bailed, and it gets ready for export. We ship it to great companies who put it back in their packaging. Like Hankel as well. Really closing the loop in the circular economy. So if you were to go to the store and buy a bottle of fa or a picture box that has social plastic, or packaged with social plastic, you would, in fact, be participating in removing plastic from ocean-bound waterways and ending poverty simultaneously. Super powerful. We're really having to create a way for every single person in the world who wants to do something about it to do it. See, the end of mind was really to create a way for everybody in humanity to participate. And you don't need to change anything. We have to create a self-perpetuating economic model that in its very existence could regenerate humanity and the earth. We couldn't fight anything. I couldn't convince anyone against their will that they should go out and clean the ocean or be a better environmental stewards or use paper instead of plastic and all those things that every environmentalist wants me to do. Super fun. So we're a for-profit social enterprise that is engaged in changing the And it's a beautiful state of flow. Oh yeah, and inside of all of it, uh, this is the funnest part for me, because we also need the exponential. And so we believe there's a banking application. So the more, so the more you collect, of course, it's a savings account, because in having a savings account, especially for like these or other places, not every place is as dangerous as Haiti, which is as well never a good place to start a business, by the way. If you live in that insecurity, and you have no access to a bank, and you only have cash, you're still going to continuously live in insecurity because you have the cash and you're always afraid that you're going to lose the cash. So we digitize it, we're creating a bank. As the name should apply. Plastic bank. So everything is transacted through the blockchain. For security. So we make sure the middleman aren't involved, that there's the mafia is not involved, that corruption can't exist, the children aren't employed. Because every piece of data exists within the blockchain. Distributed. Uncorruptible. Transparent. Should let every single person in the world know exactly what's occurring live and how much is being collected from where and what's occurring and who's participating and to create a space for every single person to as well participate. Now the fun part is like for these, the more she collects, the more frequently she collects, the higher quality of material, the higher the quality of the interaction that she has at the point of return. And then her social circle, as she brings in other collectors, and the higher quality interaction, the higher quality material they have, we provide credit rating. A credit rating. We take the absolutely unbanked and create a sense of worth. And access to come out of poverty through your own effort and beauty of your own human soul to be able to quickly and easily substantiate your reliance and your authenticity and your gift. 
And because we know how much material you're bringing, there's also what's called debt service ratio. We know how much you're earning, so we know how much you could borrow at low interest. How do we spawn other legions of entrepreneurs to borrow low interest rate loans to go and create other entrepreneurship? Wow, it's remarkable. True exponentiality for the world. We're plastic alchemists taking plastic and making it into gold. So I kind of gave you guys these ideas of working into the future, investing in what will be, and we know that what will be is regeneration. It's, it's just logical sense. Showing up now and saying you're sustainable is not enough anymore. The next generation, 40% of the economic spend in society is coming from the Greta generation. And if you're not actually the repairer, step aside. Because those companies are stepping up for that. We'll win. I talked about exponentiality, talked a little bit about, you know, this beautiful state of growth and giving everyone an opportunity to participate. See, I don't have to do very much in any of that. It's really exponential. It's putting the power in the hands of the world that wants to participate. Every congregation, every student, every parishioner, every entrepreneur, every consumer. We just launch. See, the core value of the company is to gather together. You know, I've manifested the organization. I've manifested the actions we need to take to reach success, and one of those is to bring the world together. There's a double entendre in the word, gather together. Of course, it's to go and gather the material together, but for us, it's to be the conduit for the world to then go and collect the material. Exponentiality. And putting everybody in that state of flow. And so, I hope that at the outset here as well, you might have thought how you might be able to participate all these creative minds, graphic designers or artists or journalists or whoever you might be. And I've traveled here to be in front of all of you because I wanted to gather you together. This is a way for all of you to participate. And so on behalf of Lise and every other collector we have around the world, I always want to express that you all have the opportunity to be a part of the solution and not the pollution. I'm David, thank you very much.